I just want to say uh, thank you, first of all, for having a session on this this year. It's very exciting. We've had one or two before, but it's very rare to um, have the opportunity to talk about these things to people who are interested. I usually manage to squeeze talking about this kind of research into a, uh, uh, a technical session, and you can see people just sort of slowly drifting away. So it's uh, great to know that you'll be interested. And I apologize if we have any strange artifacts in the presentation, but I'm just did one of those annoying Mac people and just exported my presentation now, so there might be bits cut off, but that does say British Memorial Project up there. Um, so it's slightly uh, intimidating experience, I suppose, to uh, come to Scandinavia and be talking about co-design and participatory design and things like that, because these are fields that are relatively uh, new to uh, British archaeology and to um, digital technology in Britain more generally, but which have a much more established legacy here. So I'd be very interested to hear um, what, what some of you think about the project afterwards, and hopefully, uh, as you say, we'll have time for discussion. But I'd really, really welcome your feedback. But um, let me tell you uh, a bit about um, what we're doing. Okay, it's not really, never mind. Um, so the rereading the British Memorial Project began um, five or six years ago. I don't remember uh, exactly. And the, the goal of the project was we were um, from a, um, an archaeological computing research group, specifically looking at digital imaging technologies and even more specifically looking at open source digital imaging technologies like photogrammetry and uh, reflectance transformation imaging and technologies like this. Um, and the driving factor behind our work, we're not specialists in cemetery studies, maybe we are now, we certainly weren't specialists in cemetery studies then. And the driving force really was that we realised there are a large community of people who are, uh, some of whom are slightly fuzzily in the background here, who are really invested in recording, documenting and analysing um, burial spaces in the United Kingdom. Um, and this is an activity that's primarily undertaken by non-expert groups, local groups, groups with a local interest, generally speaking, often groups with um, an interest in a particular burial space, perhaps a churchyard that's in the middle of their village, or within an urban context, you get groups who are interested in the preservation and analysis of large cemeteries and things like this. Um, and so there's an existing culture there. And that's a really important thing to recognise from the outset, is that we came with a technical expertise which we perceived may have value, but we came with absolutely no expectations in terms of research culture and research practice. Um, and those of you who are interested in uh, uh, participatory design and human-computer interaction will probably be starting to get a sense here that this is a, a, a model um, HCI problem in, in some senses because we come in with none of the cultural knowledge but then try to take technology into a fairly alien environment and we, we really wanted to do that well and that's what this project is about really. So why is it important to study burial space is quite an important question. Um, and we feel that it really is important. And certainly in Britain, it's uh, an area which is massively overlooked. Unlike, um, I, I, I believe, Norway, I, I certainly know other Scandinavian countries and other countries in Europe, we have very strange rules regarding burial space, which means that it's actually very difficult to reuse burial space. Um, so if someone is buried somewhere and you have a grave marker, there isn't, generally speaking, uh, a cut-off date. You don't remove graves um, and reuse burial space in the same way that other people do, which it creates very strange, often very messy, very uncared for burial spaces. But what it also means is that burial spaces are an incredible uh, cultural archaeological repository. Um, obviously for genealogical research and things like this, the study of family history, but also, more broadly speaking, art history, the study of monuments and memorialisation and forms of cultural practice associated with death in the past, um, which are really rarely preserved anywhere else. I mean, people 
don't spend as much time in historical literature talking about practices around death as they talk about other things, perhaps for obvious reasons. Um, and so very often, especially in uh, places like this and like this. So this is uh, St. George's Church on Portland, which some of you may know is a small sort of island, a peninsula off the south coast of England. And it was uh, home to a really um, small but very long standing quarrying mining community, uh, which has largely since dissolved, although many of the same families still live on the island. And this is a testament to this uh, community, a small community with a real expertise in stoneworking, which is why they ended up with a parish church, which looked like um, a cathedral, uh, a Renaissance cathedral. And the monumentation is incredible. But without the um, knowledge of this community, we wouldn't be able to interpret this. And then by interpreting this, we're able to tell a great deal about who lived there, uh, what they valued, um, and their religious tastes and practices. And then another example here is uh, uh, St. Winifred's Church in Branscombe in Devon. And this is uh, an extremely old coastal uh, churchyard. Um, and because of the uh, preservation of the churchyard, you can actually see the date of the memorials. You could map it very nicely, which we haven't done yet and should. Um, the older graves by our inside, because that was the most sacred space, and then they proceed out of the door to the second most, and then gradually the graves spread around the outside of the church until you have very new ones to the rear of the church in a modern space. And so you can see the evolution of burial space through time. So again, a really important social record. And then finally, the urban cemetery, which is uh, 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 largely 18th, 19th century, 20th century phenomenon, but just an incredible record of changing urban society. And obviously these are things which we're very interested in more generally at the moment, how societies change. And with the, uh, uh, the, the rapid movements in populations in post-industrial societies, cemeteries can form a really key point of cohesion, I think, uh, enabling people who live in a community to interpret the past of the place they live in, whether or not they have family connections going back generations, even if they're a newcomer, it can be a way into understanding the culture of the place that you come from and create a point of connection with the past. And so I think that cemeteries are obviously still active places in the sense that people are still buried in them, but I think they have a bigger social and cultural role as um, a, a space within which to understand and to uh, mediate your relationship with the past of the place that you live in and to create a sense of continuity between the past and the present. And as I say, most of the research in these spaces has been undertaken by community groups up until now. Um, and uh, our interest was in helping these groups initially. So here are just some examples of uh, um, the kinds of techniques we're using. Actually, this is all uh, reflectance transformation imaging, which some of you might be familiar with. It's an open source imaging technique, which is derived from photographs, which are lit from different directions. Um, I'm not going to introduce the technique. I've done that before at CAA, and I'm wary of uh, going over the same ground more than once. But if you haven't seen this before, I'm very happy to talk to you um, during the coffee break or afterwards about how you can start doing this, because it's all free. It requires very little equipment. And so it's great for working with community groups. Um, and what it allows you to do is enhance surface details and things. You can see a Saxon carving uh, reused in a Norman church at the top right there and in the large image at the side. And then a small 17th century uh, carving on a church door there, probably from the Civil War. And that's, they're both, no, one of them's from Somerset and the, uh, actually they're both from Somerset, from uh, Holcomb Church. And it was a church that was garrisoned during the English Civil War. So a really fascinating uh, archeological record there that the community had identified and we just helped document. Um, so really useful collaboration. But it quickly became apparent to us as we worked on the project that, um, 
it wasn't enough just to assist in documentation. As we all know, the archaeological research process, or this is sort of rendered as a data life cycle, but I think this can be used to symbolise the archaeological research process more broadly, um, has many stages. And the creation of data really is only the first stage. And it's the easiest stage, really, to engage with people on. If you take no interest in what people do for the rest of this cycle, then it's very easy to help them because you can say, here are some documentation tools. If you continue to use some of them, if they gain traction, that's fantastic. If they don't, never mind. It makes no difference to us because we're going now anyway. Um, but we were interested in how through cultivating longer lasting relationships with community groups and more um, insightful relationships with community groups. We can help community groups to navigate the whole of this um, research process from data creation all the way through processing, analysis, and then the really complex job, really complex task, and I don't think anyone will disagree with me on that, of preserving data, publishing data, and then enabling it to be reused. So you go from the very simple to the very, well, technologically simple through to technologically complex and expert, but you also go through, I think, theoretically fairly simple through to theoretically enormously complex because with each passing stage of this process you encounter new ethical issues you encounter issues of ownership um, ownership in the um, uh, personal sense how you feel about the place that you're working how you feel about the data you've produced but also legal practical issues um, and uh, the ethics surrounding the documentation of burial space, which is still active, for example. So all sorts of problems there, um, which we uh, have had to confront. But for the time being, we're only partway through this project. I think we'll always only be partway through this project. It's an ongoing and, uh, we hope, sustainable project that's been going on for a long time and shows no signs of slowing down. Um, we've been focusing on the first half of this, really. So I'd say from 90% of the project so far, we've been focusing on the first circle there at the top, actually. Um, but we've just started now to move into the rest of the space. Um, and this is, uh, oh, sorry, it's a bit weird, but you can read it this time. Uh, so this is how we're trying to navigate that space. So as I say, we're going to be dealing with the, yes, to your right, this side of the uh, diagram there for the rest of this presentation. So. We have uh, taken two approaches, basically, um, and they both relate to the development of infrastructure for community recording and the integration of community recording and recording techniques that are more conventionally used by commercial and academic archaeology in the UK. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'll just say enough that you can get the idea in principle because I don't think unless you come from the UK, if you come from the UK you probably know about this stuff, if you don't come from the UK you'll never want to know about this stuff and so it's uh, um, probably not something that I really want to dwell on too much. But the two things that we're doing are developing an OASIS form and OASIS is effectively um, well, it's a means of reporting archaeological field work. So if you're um, a community group and you go and do a survey, ideally what we would really like is for people to tell us. Otherwise, we're going to end up doing the same survey five times, as is very, very normal in this uh, field. And um, we don't necessarily want that to happen. And I say necessarily because in some instances, documenting something five times is a very good idea. But um, uh, we don't necessarily want that to happen. And so what we've been looking at doing is developing um, an OASIS form which is specifically tailored to the reporting of field work within burial spaces, so capturing appropriate metadata, denomination, um, is it associated with a religious building or is it a secular burial space and that kind of thing, uh, but also developing um, a form which will eventually be accessible to community groups. I don't mean accessible in the technical sense, so it's not too hard to actually get to the form, but also accessible uh, in the sense that it uses language that community groups would recognise and adopt and find easy. 
Um, and that's not, that's not a straightforward process of simplification. It's just that there are different research cultures and different ways of thinking about these problems. And while we're interested in uh, helping to expand the horizons of community groups as community groups have expanded our horizons, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, we're also interested in creating expertise. I mean, it's, uh, it's wrong to pretend that that isn't the case. Um, and the second point uh, that we've been working on is the development of an app which is in its very early stages, which enables community groups to document space. So um, we have guides in the UK, there's a very famous guide written by Harold Mitem, which is a guide to the documentation of burial space, and it's a standardised system. Um, but what we want to do really is to take this you know, very well, very widely adopted, very um, good system, uh, but to expand it so that we can include the kinds of things that community groups are uh, interested in doing besides uh, basic documentation. So. Um, community groups aren't necessarily interested in the same things that um, I might be. And so we want to create an app which allows an additional layer of interpret interpretation to go on top of that. And I'm, uh, we're only in the, uh, this is the early stages of interpretation, so going back to the uh, data life cycle, that really will start to take place in the second part of the project. And there we've got all sorts of plans relating to interactive media and things like that. But for the time being, we're facing here. I'm going to have to hurry, because I've got five minutes left, and I've got quite a lot to say. <laughs> You'll be sorry to know. Um, so, oh, this really is strange. Sorry, this is a bit difficult to decipher now that the uh, font's gone funny, but uh, I'll try to make as much sense of it as I can. So, um, working with partners in computer science at the University of York from the Human Computer Interaction Group, we've been looking at how to actually conceptualize this research problem. So one of the things that, uh, I hope everyone in this room will agree with me, but if you don't, then we can definitely have a conversation about this. One of the things that archeologists have been very bad at doing is actually beginning to unpack um, what happens at the interface between uh, expert and non-expert communities. So there is no easy way to, to phrase that, but I'm gonna try and uh, try to do that a little bit. Um, and what it actually means to engage with uh, community groups. So, I mean, saying that we want to create sort of more democratic, more inclusive models of archeological practice. I mean, of course we do, of course everyone does. I mean, it's almost uh, banal to the point of meaninglessness to say that because no one, I'd, well, I'd like to believe that not many people want to maintain archeology span as a really sort of exclusive, uh, small community of experts. But on the other hand, saying it and doing it are two very different things. Um, and one of the things that we were very aware of is that literature in community archaeology, um, and this isn't a criticism, it's just a reflection of the kinds of um, situations from which community archaeology developed, has tend to focus on unequal power relationships between groups. So the group between the uh, relationship between indigenous people and archaeologists, for example, which obviously is extremely important. But what it doesn't do within our area, I think, is acknowledge the complexity of those power relationships and the complexity of uh, the complexity surrounding what people have to offer. So it's not that we're a university who are bestowing knowledge onto local societies. In fact, it's far more complex than that. It's like a big Venn diagram of overlapping expertise and interest. And we have uh, local research groups. We also have researchers from universities, but we also have national organizations. So we're working with Historic England and the Council for British Archaeology um, and the Church's Conservation Trust. And then we also have uh, uh, civil society. So we have people from local government. We have people from national government. We have churches. We have the Church of England. We've been working with them. So it's not us who has the power in this situation. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are people far more powerful than us who have a vested interest in this research area. So what we've tried to do is just to get a sense of what the needs of these different communities are. And I will characterize them all as communities because they all have the essential characteristics of a, a community group of different kinds. And then trying to figure out whether those needs are compatible and how we can in some way reconcile those into a meaningful uh, system of documentation. Um, so I've actually just uh, uh, skipped over this now because I was uh, going to talk about the uh, uh, different kinds of institutions we've got here. Um, 
so I'll just uh, skip to the end. So um, we decided uh, very naively that the solution to this problem was um, to employ people who specialised in actually analysing these things. As archaeologists, we specialise in documentation, we specialise in the management of archaeology. I say we, I don't mean you, I mean the people in our project specialise in uh, documentation and the management of archaeological data and uh, these kinds of things. We do not really specialise in um, working with community groups and we've been doing it for a long time. So some of the community groups that we've been cooperating with, we've been cooperating with for five years or something now. And <laughs> we really felt, yeah, we know these people, we know what they want, we work together, it's fine, we've got a really functional relationship. Um, but we, uh, perhaps stupidly, but I think for the greater good, decided to put that to the test, um, really, and have um, uh, a, uh, a researcher, uh, Professor Helen Petrie, who's uh, a, uh, an interaction design and human computer interaction specialist who's worked with all sorts of different groups um, uh, to come along with us and actually start to study these relationships and that's where we are now really so my, I'm getting the first reflections on this process at the moment which are that actually there are far more complex things at work here than we are really able to appreciate and going into the process of enabling um, uh, community groups to participate in the interpretation and publication of these things. It's important that we recognise that um, the relationships between the different stakeholders are far more complex. Sorry, I'm aware that I'm running out of time now, so I'm just going to wrap up here. And the, the point we're getting to now, really, is that we need to uh, design tools which enable a, uh, a sort of uh, a pluralistic model of um, uh, of research and that, that, yeah, yeah, that different people are going to approach the problem in different ways. So community groups, for example, have a real interest in um, genealogical research. That's one thing that they absolutely love, about which we know very little. And we have tended to marginalise that and that's come out here in our analysis. Uh, whereas we're interested in um, uh, things like art historical and um, archaeological questions, which perhaps aren't so evident to them. Uh, and rather than that being a sense of uh, us having a, um, uh, trying to sort of uh, uh, bring those two things together directly, uh, the human computer interactions or cognitive uh, approaches mean that we're actually able to begin to perhaps, um, uh, yeah, we'll recognize how those things can sit side by side so that we're capturing the same essential metadata so that our uh, data that we produce are um, interoperable and able to form part of a bigger whole, but that they also uh, reflect the kinds of uh, interpretations that different groups want to make. And ultimately, that's going to lead to a far richer data set, because if we have um, different sites documented in different ways, and this is going back to the idea of doing things more than once, uh, we can get community groups who are interested just in um, locating the work of one stonemason, for example, to go to churches and document things. That doesn't mean, though, necessarily that the work has been done. It means that then other people can come in and uh, do other work side by side with those people. Um, and we're going to need to start to manage uh, the uh, yeah, sense of ownership that perhaps uh, uh, we all have over our research and how we can enable these processes to take place. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there, I think. So that's a bit of an abrupt conclusion. But I will.